Well, of course, it came from the Council of Europe. The Council of Europe was founded in 1949 in the aftermath of the Second World War to defend human rights, parliamentary democracy and the rule of law. It was set up really in a defensive mood by the Western European democracies who were seriously worried about the possibility of further encroachment of the Warsaw Pact westwards. It was founded to develop continent-wide arrangements to standardise member countries' social and legal practices so that there are documents, there are projects, discussion, papers and so on and so forth going back over many years on key social issues, capital punishment, the dealing uh, appropriately with uh, prisoners and so on and so forth. It was also founded, though, to promote awareness of a European identity based on shared values and cutting across cultures. In other words, from the beginning, there was a recognition that if there was to be this defense of human rights, parliamentary democracy, and the rule of law, if there were to develop these agreements across all the member countries... All of that would need to be founded on a program of steady commitment to exchange of a cultural and historical kind. The key instruments of the Council of Europe are the European Convention on Human Rights, which among many other things is a good starting point for arguments having to do with learn autonomy and the European Cultural Convention as far as the Council of Europe and Language Learning are concerned the European Cultural Convention article number 2 says it all but it says it in the beginnings of a style of English which Brussels has taken on and made its own each contracting party shall, insofar as may be possible, which of course always means that you can say it's impossible, <laughs> A, encourage the study by its own nationals of the languages, history and civilization of the other contracting parties and grant facilities to those parties to promote such studies in its territory. So it has to do with having foreign languages in your curriculum and encouraging countries where those languages are native um, to do various things to support that general aim. B. Endeavour to promote the study of its language or languages, history and civilization in the territory of the other contracting parties and grant facilities to the nationals of those parties to pursue such studies in its territory clearly that degree of reciprocity is achieved only by a handful of Western European countries but the general ideal of cultural and historical exchange depending crucially on linguistic exchange depending crucially on language learning is clear enough the Council of Europe's cultural educational agenda can be summed up like this. First of all, education for democratic citizenship, as I've already mentioned. That explains, again as I've said, a commitment to learner autonomy and lifelong learning. Secondly, promotion of cultural and linguistic diversity. Hence a commitment to plurilingualism, Hence a commitment also to partial competences. An attempt to get away from the idea that it's not worth learning a language unless you can be absolutely sure of being correct every time you want to use the past subjunctive. <laughs> 
and thirdly, facilitating individual mobility and hence a desire to establish a means of comparing different systems of certification. Implementing this agenda with regard to its linguistic dimensions, we have the language policy division in Strasbourg that's responsible for developing key policy documents and instruments including the Common European Framework and the European Language Portfolio. And then we have the European Centre for Modern Languages in Graz. The important thing to start by saying is that Graz is subject to a partial agreement. 33 Council of Europe member states are also members of the European Centre for modern languages. The point there being that to be a member, you have to pay. <coughs> That's how the place is funded. Uh, fortunately, the number of member countries signed up to ECML has increased fairly dramatically since 2001 and the European Year of Languages. And I'm happy to say that the governments of both the United Kingdom and Ireland were shamed into joining in 2001. Graz operates these medium-term programs that were referred to by Eva in her introduction. So yeah, pick up little tiny bits of Swedish. And within those programs you have projects that are built around workshops and conferences that aim to disseminate ideas and good practice in relation to language teaching and learning. We're currently in the second year of the four-year medium-term program from 2004 to 7, which has four strands, and within that project C6, training teachers to use the European language portfolio, is the one that brings me here to you today and about which you've already heard a little. <coughs> Back in 1991, the Swiss government founded a famous symposium in Rüschlikon. I hadn't heard of Rüschlikon before I heard of the symposium, and I don't think many other people had either. But the Rüschlikon symposium was a very, very important event for subsequent developments because it was that symposium, an intergovernmental uh, symposium, that recommended the development of a common European framework to promote and facilitate cooperation among educational opportunity, uh, institutions in different countries, to provide a sound basis for the mutual recognition of language qualifications. Again, you see this strand of continuity from the unit credit schemes of the early 1970s to assist learners, teachers, course designers, examining bodies and educational administrators. And then the people who drafted this clearly scratched their heads and said, if you've got learners and teachers and course designers and examining bodies and educational administrators, what verbs can you possibly use? to say what they might all do. Well, situate and coordinate their efforts was what they came up with. The Rüschlikon Symposium also recommended the establishment of a working party to consider possible forms and functions of a European language portfolio. And it proposed that the European language portfolio should contain a section in which formal qualifications are related to a common European scale, another in which the learner, him or herself, keeps a personal record of language learning experiences, and possibly a third which contains examples of work done. So there's your three-part structure. And work went on through the 1990s, and in 1997, 
there was an intergovernmental conference in Strasbourg. That conference launched the second draft of the Common European Framework, which was already revised on the basis of widespread consultation and was to be revised again before being published in its so far canonical form in English by the Cambridge University Press and in French by Didier in Paris. It also introduced a series of proposals for the development of European language portfolios for language learners of different ages and in different domains. And it recommended the establishment of pilot projects in the member states. So the pilot projects began in 1998. And they were a very interesting thing to be involved in because there was no template to work from. No one had said exactly what a European language portfolio should be. We had these preliminary suggestions. But basically we had to make it up as we went along and we had to learn from one another. Between us in the pilot projects, we covered all domains of language learning, primary, lower and upper secondary, vocational, university, adult. The Swiss ELP project was a very great help to everyone else. The Swiss had conducted the empirical research that underpinned the definition of the common reference levels in the common European framework. And out of that research, they developed checklists for the different levels and the different activities for their own portfolio. And they were made generally available. And that ensured that there would be a degree of continuity across different models. And the principles and guidelines that define the ELP and govern the process of validation and accreditation evolved in parallel with this work. There were 15 Council of Europe member states involved in this project. It may be news to you that Sweden was among them. Austria, Czech Republic, Finland, France, Germany, Hungary, Ireland, Italy, Netherlands, Portugal, Russia, Slovenia, Sweden, Switzerland and the United Kingdom. There were also three international non-government organisations they were CERCLA that I've mentioned, the, Uni the European Language Council, which is another university language organization, and EQUALS, which is the European Association for Quality Language Services. And that immediately tells you that it's private sector. Participating in the pilot projects were an estimated 30,000 learners and 2,000 teachers. That's pretty small. It's small when you think that there are supposed to be, I think it's 108 million children learning languages in secondary schools across the Council of Europe member states. But at least it was something. You can still get the full report on the pilot projects, which is worth looking at and mulling over, from the Council of Europe's website. Common findings from the pilot projects were these. Learners of all ages quickly tire of the ELP if they work with it only occasionally in order to bring it up to date, especially when that's simply a matter of filling in forms and ticking boxes. Learners value the ELP to the extent that it's central to their language learning. In the two examples I'm going to show you in the second and third parts of this talk, that seems to me to be the key to success. If you think you might take on the ELP as an added extra, don't. Because you will quickly come to regret it giving yourself extra work and involving the kids in something they won't want to be bothered with. If you think you can find a way of using it 
to explore certain kinds of aspects of language learning and language use in a fresh way then by all means do it and you'll probably succeed when the ELP is central to language learning it supports the development of learner reflection self-management and autonomy I was privileged to go and do seminars with teachers involved in several of these pilot projects and the impact that the ELP had in countries that were sometimes struggling in the reconstruction of Eastern Europe to achieve anything at all was really very gratifying. Finally, the reporting and pedagogical functions of the ELP support one another. By which I mean, if the pedagogical function isn't fully developed and fulfilled, you won't actually have anything very much or impressive to report. On the other hand, the attraction of having something really substantial to report and to show can be a significant motivating factor in getting the ELP working. <clears throat>